is an honor to be here um, during this Black History Month, um, this eve of Valentine's Day. Uh, <laughs> and to, have, to see some of my favorite people in this space, so I want to thank you all. Um, I want to thank the Saginaw Art Museum for opening up their space. Um, and not just opening up their space, but also opening their vision for these types of installations um, and these types of offerings that communities are willing to make. I also want to thank all of the funders, donors to the Saginaw Art Museum, including the semi, our Hemlock Semi conductor um, and others for making these opportunities possible. One of the great things that's happening right now, um, there are about five exhibits uh, really recognizing black contributions to American history here in Saginaw. Three that are happening here um, at SVSU, at the Castle Museum, um, just saw that Tears and Baldwin's, they're having a tasting on the 28th. There is a lot to celebrate as it relates to black people, as it relates to American history. So I just want to say thank you. I also want to thank the Gregory's, Kevin and Tanya, for donating the wine. Um, they are just true blessings to my life, true blessings to Saginaw, and we are honored to have them here. Um, so they make it all worth it. <laughs> and of course, all of you, and especially you. <laughs> so this is gonna be just a short talk, you know, to talk about black tiki, but also to talk about the black hand side. The black hand side would not be what it is if it weren't for the other artists, creators, and collaborators. Some of them are here today, uh, and we'll bring them up and recognize them uh, more formally. So throughout most of my childhood and my teenage years, I remember my family having this trunk, you know, on those chests, a trunk. Yeah. <laughs> it was always kept in, you know, the house that we rented in uh, Carlton, Michigan, right on Baylor Court. So anybody from Carlton familiar with Carlton? Yeah. <laughs> Yep, 4566, 4583, 4570, 71. Those are the three houses that we basically grew up in in Carlton, but we always had this large trunk. And the thing about this trunk is it had these two narrow straps that I remember. I think one was like even falling apart. So in my childhood mind, this trunk was old. It was old. Um, and had one of those keys, old key that had like this leather strap. I don't know why my grandmother kept it on the leather strap because it was all, the keys had other keys, but it always had the leather strap attached to this set of keys. But in the wear and tear made sense um, because my great grandmother, Annabelle Seeley, brought the trunk with her from Tuscaloosa, Alabama to Gary, Indiana. Great grandmother Anna was born in 1896. Her mother, was born in 1870, her father born in 1850. So when she left Tuscaloosa, Alabama with her belongings to go to Gary, Indiana to join my mom, my granddad, and my grandmother, she was making that second, what we call the second wave of the Great Migration North. And so many families, including my dad, his family, a lot of them came from the South to come to the North for a number of reasons. How many people are from the South or have origins in the South? Okay, so you probably came in one of those ways of that great, of that great migration North. So the trunk eventually made it to Saginaw. I think Beacon Hill or some street, but I don't know, it got to Carlton. Yeah, no, it got to Carlton. Um, and I remember there being a few things in this in this trunk, in, this, um, in, the, in the chest, um, it included, there were some quilts in there. I know that there were quilts in there. Uh, my great-grandmother, Annabelle Seeley, she was a quilter. Um, if you know anything about, there, so this, this is the actual one. You know, I found this photograph, you know, to try to give you the, you know, give you a little visual. But it looked very much like this, and it had a lot of stuff in it from quilts, some of them are right here, that Naisha installed. Um, but in, in addition to these 10 that you see here, there were other quilts, there were other items. There were, there were some clothes in there. I remember there being this black coat. I don't know why I remember this black coat, but there was an, 
I think I buy black trench coats because of that coat. And my mom knows that I buy a lot of coats. Um, it also had my mom's childhood collection of dolls, or at least what was left of these dolls. Um, no shade against my mom, and this was typical at the time. Uh, a lot of black women and young black girls had dolls. Most times those dolls did not look like them. But my mom did have one black doll, and so if you came to my, uh, my first exhibit here in Saginaw, you saw the doll that had been in that trunk from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, over to Gary, Indiana, Saginaw, Michigan, over to Detroit, Michigan, to the contents, going to Philadelphia, D.C., and all the other places I've lived in between coming back here. Um, so very honored to have uh, those items. The trunk often also felt very special to me. So it felt special for a number of reasons that it was like, hmm. When I was a little kid, and I, so, I associated trunks with what? Treasure. Treasure. <laughs> treasures. <laughs> Hidden treasures. But you know, it was, it was also mysterious. And what added to the allure was the times in which the trunk was open. So we were in Saginaw, we're in Carlton. What happens in Carlton basements? Flood. You remember the flood of 86? Yeah. yeah. So anytime there was heavy rain, there's always seemed to be this urgent rush to go to the trunk and to check on the contents. And the other thing was that my grandmother seemed like she was the only one, like she was the key master. She was the only one that I, I saw open up. Mind you ever open it? See, see, I, I don't remember anyone ever opening the trunk and had added to the, the whole allure about it. Now, one thing about me, you know, I've kind of hinted to my age, I'm 45. In the 80s, there were these great movies, Indiana Jones. And those movies spoke to me. Like, I was, in, I was so certain that those movies, if I watched them close enough, they would help me understand how to get to that hidden treasure, how to get into that trunk. And for a number of reasons. My mom was from Indiana. <laughs> or at least she grew up in Indiana. You want to guess the rest? I'm Jones. My last name is Jones, so Indiana Jones. Like, they were speaking to me. So much so that in third grade when, um, I remember Ebony Dottery was sitting next to me in Carlton Elementary School. Um, that was my ace. And the teacher asked, what do we want to be when we grew up? I didn't really know, but I knew the word archaeology and archaeologist. And so I, I remember saying I wanted to be an archaeologist and discover hidden treasures in Egypt. Now, I made it to Africa, been, been in southern Africa, worked there for um, few, a couple of months, um, but never made it to Egypt. In fact, attended the University of Michigan, took my first archaeology 101 course, because, you know, I was, I'm about to be an archaeologist. This is at Kevin after, you know, econ didn't really work out. Kevin and I had some econ courses together. But um, so archaeology 101 didn't work out, but also because it, was, it met at 8 a.m. on Wednesdays and Fridays. And so it wasn't really meant for me at the time. Um, but back to the story. So like the trunk, like my mom, my dad also was from the South. Uh, my dad, he grew up in Philadelphia, Mississippi. <laughs> So he attended um, a school called Booker T. Washington School, which was um, the first school for black kids in Philadelphia or in Neshoba County, Mississippi. Um, and he also graduated, he was the, part of the last class to graduate um, that was completely segregated. The, close, the school actually closed um, around 1970 because of integration, because uh, people wanted to maintain segregated ways, particularly uh, in the roots of Jim Crow South. But um, my dad and my mom, and especially with my grandma who was um, living with us, helping to take care of my, my older sister right here. Hey, Tricia. Um, <laughs> uh, my older brother who's not here uh, today. Me and my twin brother, we were about six months old at the time, my identical twin brother. But we grew up in this household where we discussed the joys of what it meant for them to grow up in the South or what they described as the joys, you know. My dad always talked about on Christmas getting that orange and getting some bag of nuts and some, um, 
and some hard candies to put inside the orange, and that was part of the gift. And there was a lot of joy there. But they also share the not so joyous moments of what it meant to be in the South. Um, they, or, them, or their relatives, you know, were sharecroppers. They picked cotton, very likely on the same plantations and on the same lands, actually I don't call them plantations, on the same um, camps of forced labor um, where their ancestors were forced to pick cotton. Um, they had to exist in Jim Crow South where they had to cross the street if a white person was coming by, never really looking in the eyes of a white woman or even, a, for that matter, a white man. There's sometimes not even a child or teenager who was white. They had to say yes, sir, and no, sir, even to people that didn't even deserve that level of respect. But this is the way it was, especially in the South, and even when my dad, you know, you know, shared stories of being at steering gear at General Motors and some of the racialized tension when, you know, coming from the South and, and being here in the North. Um, but the South was the home. Philadelphia, Mississippi was home. And in 1964, um, when Dr. Martin Luther King came to Philadelphia, Mississippi, my dad, my great granddad, who was raising my father at the time, um, told him he could not go to the rally. From my history buffs, civil rights buff, what happened in Philadelphia, Mississippi in 1964? One of my degrees is in education, so I try to go back to this little teaching role, like I'm a teacher and all this stuff. But it's 1964, what happened? Yes, sir. Yes. So anybody remember the story of the, of the three civil rights um, workers? Cheney Goodman. So Cheney Goodman Schwerner. Cheney, black mayor from Philadelphia in Neshoba County, Mississippi. Um, Goodman and Schwerner, they were uh, Part of, the, you know, part, of, part of the Freedom Summer, the Freedom Riders, this group of about 700 white people that we would call allies who came to the South to not only help register voters, but help spark um, and be a part of the grassroots, grassroots movement, particularly to uh, end some of the racial and political injustices that were you know, being heaped on us as black people. Um, but they were kidnapped. They were lynched. Actually, the bodies were, they were yep, they were shot. They found the bodies about six weeks later, not too far from uh, the church where my grandfather, or my, my, my dad's great grandfather, or my dad's grandfather, my great grandfather, um, where they attended church. And so even when we, I remember the last time, Trisha, we went back to the family reunion, you see the plaque um, near our family, you know, where our family's buried, um, commemorating the moment um, where the bodies were discovered. But there was terror. There was terror for the families. And so this was part of what it meant for uh, people like my dad to sometimes, or to, to grow up in that area. But they shared these stories. They didn't hide it from us. They kept the jet magazines on the table that not only celebrated and talked about the, great, the greatness of what we were accomplishing as black people, but also asking the question of why was Emmett Till lynched? You know, talked about other assassinations of other, of other black leaders. Everything being very important to understand and have those conversations. But they also share what it meant for, for them to be black and for what it meant for us or what they hoped for, uh, for it. Hmm, let me start over. They talked about what it meant for us to be black as well as their hope for us. As young black kids, as black men, black women, they, they wanted us to grow in our blackness, not to be ashamed of who we were, to really help us understand that all things are possible. Even for us as black people, all things are possible. We celebrated when black people were in the news, uh, whether or not it was um, you know, opening the Saginaw newspaper and seeing a picture of Reverend Worthy from Shiloh Baptist Church. My grandmother was quick to clip it clip out the article and put it in the family Bible. Or as a number of pictures of me and my twin brother coming from Saginaw General in our little stockings uh, around Christmas time. And, you know, or, you know, Trisha or Pam Pugh or the Pugh's our neighbors. So 
they were always in the news. So we got this whole, ar still have this archive of Saginaw newspaper clippings of, of black people in Saginaw, as well as around the, around the world. Certainly if it was Michael Jackson, you know, it was always a little special because again, mama lived in Gary. So, you know, we had the internet, so it was easy. It's like, yeah, my mama knew Michael. I might have threw that out there a couple of times. Um, she didn't know Michael. <laughs> she ain't know. Now, she might have knew his babysitter, Aunt Callie. Rumor has it she, she was a babysitter, but you know, Aunt Callie not here. So, it's what it is. But we were taught to, um, to really only celebrate blackness. Celebrate black, blackness in all its forms. Even when if it was in our, our humor, but we were taught to celebrate blackness. Um, but I truly believe that what I've described in those moments that I've described is really what solidified my passions for um, American history, um, but especially understanding and examining the role of black people, especially as, as major players in American history. It's been my family's journey from the South to the North, uh, you know, personally from coming to Saginaw, moving to Detroit. It's been those journeys and those experiences that really showed me how I want to collect and what I want to collect. Even in the most harshest stories that my family shared, there was always a lesson learned. There was a, there was a diamond, there was jewelry, there was, there was a treasure. And so when I go to antique shops or when I'm searching for items, you know, I'm looking for those treasures. I want to be able to help you know, do the mining, do that archaeological dig, do the cleaning off, and present these items. You know, not, not to not talk about what they meant, not to rewrite the story of racism or how these objects of our oppression have been used, but also to say, no, this is a part of American history. Look at this. This is the reality in which we have had to exist or which we may have had to live. But then there's this other side of it. Because with more than 400 years of oppression, you still see the greatness of blackness. And I stand by that. I stand by that. Um, but today, and for more than 20 years, I've been a collector of black memorabilia. Black memorabilia is defined loosely as those objects um, that reference Afro African Americans or Afro Europeans. It, it ranges from the most celebratory items to those that were created to poke and make fun of black people, so those with the exaggerated features, those items that, you know, try to play up certain stereotypes. Those are the types of items that I tend to collect. It's also those items that my grandmother shared, the items that my grandmother collected. That's my grandmother right there. <laughs> uh, I remember the first quote-unquote offensive item that I found was a salt and pepper shaker. Uh, hey, right here. Look at this. Wow. These types of salt and pepper shakers, the ancient mama salt and pepper shakers. And I remember going to this flea market and seeing, you know, in the sea of items, a lot of white items, a lot of jewelry, not a lot of blacks. That was like, that was the only black thing. And I, and I'm, I love colors, you know, um, I, I, I love looking at colors. I, think, I like when things stand out and that stood out to me. And I, and I, and I remember just before I even walking up to the table, just like, Thinking like, hmm. Rosa was like, "What is that?" I've been wearing bifocals since 26, so it was, you know, I had to get a little bit closer because you know it could have been like, I don't know, could have been something else. Get benefit of the doubt. So I got closer. They smiled. They greeted me, and I was thinking like, "Why do they have this item? Are they racist?" Well, they said hi to me. They know I'm black. <laughs> We had great conversations. And so I remember, you know, paying, you know, my $36 for the salt pepper shaker, which I was like, damn, ain't no reparation discount? Like, I don't get no, yeah, sorry, young folk, I'm so sorry. Um, but you know, I was thinking, I, I did think that, uh, you know. But, um, but as, I, I, as, I, as I exchanged the money and for my merchandise and received the receipt, um, I remember, and, and this is something I started doing and haven't stopped doing, I, but this time I smiled at them and, and thanked them for preserving these items for me. Yes. That was my way in, at that time of like sticking it to them. Like, I'm, 
I'm gonna do this for all the races known and unknown. You know, these are my items. So they don't know, they're just doing this for me because I was in that mind like, you know, I can manifest. Uh, and I was manifesting. Um, but so much would go through my mind um, when I would find these items in different locations and different places. It always allowed me to have interesting conversations with, with people, particularly about the reasons they collect these items, what they mean for them, how they first acquired their first item, them sharing stories of, you know, the black boyfriend coming over to the grandparents' house, promising they'd never come back because the lawn jockey in the yard that been in there for 30 years and nobody ever recognized. Um, you know, those types of stories where these things have been so commonplace, where people, you know, if you look through the Black Hand Side exhibit, you'll see we play with, the, we play with quantity. And some of that's a show around mass consumption and how, how you can receive these items, you know, whether or not you send in a, a barcode and get your Angel Mama Breakfast Club pins. Um, you know, there's, you know, and this was just wasn't in the United States, even in Europe. Um, in the UK, they have, a, they have these dolls called the Gollywog dolls. Um, very dark features, um, bright lips, white eyes, um, you know, and you could, they have a safety magazine for kids. And if you answer all the questions right, you can get your own golly dog, Gollywog pen. You could even choose out of the eight Gollywogs that you wanted. So this is how these items were not just created, but how they were dis distributed from whether or not government agencies to private, di private dealers and, and so on. Um, so, but I want to tell you more about the antique shops because I think the antique shops are very fascinating. Um, when I go to an antique shop, it's generally like my safe haven. I'm an introvert, so all this is performance. So if you all see me at the club, twerking, pop locking at 45, this is all an act. I ain't really like that. I'm, I truly, no, I really don't do that. But I really, <laughs> I really am an introvert. So even after this, I'll go home and sleep for like four days, you know, to get my energy back and, and get, my, um, get my energy back. But um, the antique shops, especially during COVID, I had to go in there with my mask on, not to talk to anybody, cause just go look, get on my hands and knees and just go look. Um, and even to this day, like the reality is I won't go to sleep after this. I'm probably going to an antique shop because I just heard a vendor has some items that I might want to get. But I'm fond of antique, mo antique shops and especially antique malls. Um, you know, depending on the, ve the vendor, it's very easy to get distracted by the eye candy. So if you're like me, it's like, ooh, a hamster. But you know, there's so many other, <laughs> there's so much there. So going to an antique shop, um, you have to be careful. Or else you're just, if you're like me, like you're, you'll end up on, a, you know. My fear is that I'll end up on this issue of hoarders and you know, it'll, it'll be, and it'll, it'll probably come out in the month of Black, uh, Black History Month. And they'll come in the house, they'll see all my items, and they'll just, it'll be subtitled um, Underground Railroad. And, because I'll be underneath all this stuff. And so y'all pray for me that I get this space so we have a museum and blah, blah, blah. But going to an antique shop, um, it's really like an archeological dig. Yes. It truly is like an archeological dig. Um, and just like an archeological dig, you have to know something about the, it's out, this is what I learned on TV, Indiana Jones, you know, Goonies, um, Eddie Murphy, Golden Child. This is what I learned for archeology. span um, and the few classes that I attended for Archaeology 101 at the University of Michigan that I did pass, by the way, um, did pass. Uh, but first, and even before you go to an antique shop, it is important, it is imperative to understand why you're going. Yeah. It's important to know what you, it is, you need to know what you're looking for and why, and why you're seeking these items. This is my opinion. Um, it's also helpful to understand history and time periods. What may have happened during this particular time period that's represented by this art? Because generally you can tell based on the vendor the type of aesthetic that they have. And so if it's Victorian, it's like, hmm, what happened in the Victorian picture, in the Victorian periods? Um, so it's important, in my opinion, to, to really understand what's happening there. You also have to understand the physical layout. So if you go to an antique mall, 
Like, some of them, they got, they got street names down the aisles. That's how, that's how complicated it can be. So it's very important to know how to scope out your strategy. Understand the layout. So I always tell people, never go like, don't just charge in there and go down, because then people are just like, oh, he, they eager. You know, you gotta be careful when you go in. So either go to the left, go to the right, and I always start in the glass cases. Always, because people put the most valuable stuff, or what they think the most valuable is in, in the glass cases. So I usually start, you know, going left, right, working very carefully, and what am I looking for? I'm not even looking for an item. I'm looking for a color. I'm looking for black. I'm looking for black in all its hues. I'm looking for black in its grays. I'm looking for the reds and blacks, the blues and blacks. I'm looking for the blue black. Actually, I learned about blue black when I moved to Detroit and, and everybody had, had a blue black, the blue black wraps and the blue black double French rolls. But I look, I look for black. I look for the likeness of black people. Now, I've been collecting, my archive is about 5,000 pieces, so um, I kind of have a sense when I see certain pieces or a certain color or when I see two colors together, my eyes will go to it. I also have, have there's a lot of historical images that you'll find, and if you look very carefully, you'll see a, you have to say, is that a black person in that corner? And you just stay hold there in some position of servitude. So those are the types of items that I'm looking for when I go into an antique shop. These are the items that hold treasures to unlock history. So I'm like the meanings of context and how we absorb those histories. Um, so sometimes those most important items might be in that glass case, and sometimes they're not. Um, often when I get to the open shelf items, this is where the, uh, the next part of this journey is. And you have to really commit. So if you're not really willing to commit, you know, just walk up and down the aisles. I'm the person that's usually on my hands and knees digging through the pieces. Why? They're treasures. But also these treasures are hidden. Because in this moment in time, you know, especially over the last 10 years, it's, it's becoming harder to find, it was, it, was, it was becoming harder to find these items. Store owners didn't want to carry them. They don't want to be called racist. They don't want to lose business. So sometimes they put them in obscure places. Or it is, and sometimes vendors just have so much stuff. So it, you really just got to get on your hands and knees. And then you might find other items. Like I, I, I look for Yadro pieces. I look for, you know, my friend Peter collects clowns. You know, I, I, there's been a number of people that, you know, I have one friend who loves Miss Piggy. So old New Yorker magazines from, uh, with Miss Piggy. I'm like, so I find different pieces for people. So if you have something that you like, it gives me a reason to go to the antique shop. So, so um, when you go to the antique shop, sometimes the cabinet is locked. And you have to, um, sometimes in the antique shop, you have to identify the key holder. And they're usually one of the vendors, and they come in, they volunteer or work on the weekends, and um, I'm seeing some head nods, so they, some gifts, thank you. I've been at the antique shop. Um, but you have to find the key holder. Um, one thing I've discovered, and I want to give this tip to you, when you go on your black teakin journey, never get too excited in front of the key holder. <laughs> and I'm, I, I really feel like I'm telling secrets. Now I can, I'm, I, I'm, so, no, because then I'm, uh, they, they, they're not going to fall for this anymore. <laughs> So, you know, you never, never get too excited from the key holder. Actually, look a little disappointed. Pick up the item. Is this a scratch? Hmm. This is a Philip Hale screwdriver. Screw on here. I like originals. Um, hmm. Oh, I got too many of those. I'll think about it. You know, you really got to make them understand that this is a treasure. And one thing I've discovered, so that used to be, again, I'm an introvert, so everything I do is an act. Because otherwise I'm just like, oh, I just want to get my stuff and get out of here and, and go, you know, what, play, finish playing Blessed Unleashed or Dying Light 2. 
that just came out. Um, Cause I like my video games. But so I say I'm, I'm, I'm sharing these secrets, my trade secrets, because those initially were ways in which I was able to engage vendors and different people about collections. Learning why they collect these items. They help me understand some of the histories, or at least their understanding of the histories of these items. We're able to engage in conversations, and, and especially like as I've been going to some shops, you know, at this point, over 10 years, you know, we've grown almost as family members. They prayed for my dad when he had a stroke. They continue to ask about my dad. You know, if I haven't come in two weeks, you know, I have one who calls me because she wants to make sure I'm okay. And I don't think I've even bought anything in the last two years here, but we go, we share cookies, we have tea. Um, you know, we've be, we become kind of like best friends. Um, but we have great um, antique shops, antique malls here in the Great Lakes Bay region. And I encourage you all to, to definitely go and, and, and be a part. One of the other things that happens in the antique, in the antique shops or antique malls, um, and this is the other reason why it's difficult to get excited in front of the gate, the key holder, because sometimes you, what you're pulling out of that cabinet truly is or was used as an object of oppression. And in those moments, I have to sit, st I'm, I'm still. I have to take in the moment that this item was used to debase people that look like me, to poke fun of people that look like me, to humiliate, enslave, to abuse, to terrorize people like me. Often the items weren't used to love me. These items weren't used by their creators to take care of me. These items weren't used, bought, sold, exchanged to contributed reparations. Sometimes these items sat in front of people, people with privilege, people of means, as they enjoyed ancient mama pancakes, sent the children to, to, to very good schools, and then they went out to be racist. I also believe that some of these pieces were by people that just had these pieces and never really thought about them. I'm willing to believe that there are many of us in this room who may have grown up in households with these pieces. And I don't, I don't, I grew up in a household with these pieces. Um, and I tell people, you know, it's not for me to decide who races, who not. Like, I, that's too much. Like, I had to, I'm trying to be less introverted. Um, so I don't have time to be thinking about that. Um, but I do ask people to, to not just think of these items as something cute, something whimsical. Or if I'm in an antique shop and I'm walking around cradling a doll, just give me that moment. Because I'm recognizing that this black doll probably has not been played with or touched in a very long time. I think about my mom's experience and her love of dolls, but often not having dolls that looked like her. I think about my nieces, who were trying to continue to steal, you know, a, a, a great sense of identity you know, as they explore their identities, and that they have the types of items and images around them that will make them feel whole. Are they receiving the types of messages around them that will make them understand clearer pictures or different pathways? So I believe that having those items, again, I'm an educator at hand, you know, public health worker, so I do believe in using certain imagery to promote conversations, to build community, facilitate dialogue, and, and these items have allowed that in many ways. Um, I do think one of the things that's interesting, and you know, this is for my, uh, my antique shop owners and my vendors, I always find it interesting that sometimes it's usually one black dial unless it's Black History Month. Then they all come out. It's a party. <laughs> it's a party. I love it, though. So like, that's why I'm, I, I know that. I mean, because some of this is around consumerism. 
So when people ask me, what is black tiki? You know, I let them know that um, black tiki is this intentional act of collecting, preserving, and sharing um, black stories, black experiences, particularly off the things that I find. When my, when my friend's like, what you doing on the weekend? I'm going to the antique shop. They got tired of hearing that, so that's when I really came up with Black Deacon. I was like, well, I'm black, I like going to antique -in. Black Deacon. Okay. I'm simple. Oh, but there's no K. So we're, I get this all the time. Like, why is there no K in Black Deacon? Anybody want to take a guess? Anyone want to take a guess? Yeah. So my name is Kevin. I got a twin brother named Kenneth. We don't need another K. <laughs> so. Um, but I collect these items because they really do um, connect to my, personally, to the stories of my upbringing, to my family's upbringing, to our journeys um, throughout the United States and um, especially throughout the South. Um, I, I am quick to remind people that when I'm in that antique shop, when I'm in my place of stillness, I'm often trying to connect with the person who may have been the inspiration behind that offensive item. Who was the black person they were thinking of when they created this? That's my friend. That's probably my relative. That might have been my uncle. At another time, that might have been me. So I try to connect at a very, you know, I don't know how well I do it, but I try to connect with what's behind that item because I know that there was somebody that they, they were thinking about and so I'm not thinking about the races that might have made it. I'm thinking about the person that might have been on the other side of that item and let them be whole, let them have the life, let them have the dignity that they deserve. I'm quick to remind people that in September 2020, um, President and insurrectionist Trump, um, <laughs> you know, basically put a directive out that said, you know, people could not, we have to stop all of our anti-bias training. So my, my education degree is in social justice education, so I do a lot of work around equity, equity and inclusion um, and working with nonprofits and philanthropic organizations. And a lot of our partners had to stop some of their trainings, particularly those who receive federal dollars, or figure out how do you talk about American history and the ways in which people are trying to get folks to talk about American history. Um, he also said that we couldn't talk about white privilege. I thought that was a good dramatic pause. Um, <laughs> I did, that wasn't. <laughs> Lark, why you shaking your head? I thought that was, I practiced that. Um, <laughs> No, but, um, but it, I think when we, we're seeing it today, you know, a year and a half later, where more and more places are, are, are banning books. You know, you can't go to your local school board meeting without people demanding that their children receive the type of education that their parents want them to receive. Those parents should definitely have a choice in their, in their children's education, uh, which I do believe. Um, but at what expense? I think that's why we have homeschooling, though, but that's a whole other whole topic around homeschooling. Um, but I'm quick, I do remind people of the ways in which um, these histories have, throughout time, been squashed, they've been minimized, they've been, we've been encouraged not to talk about certain things. So, I'm going to talk about it. That's what my grandmother would say. And like, I'm going to talk about it. Um, so that, that, that's really what my work is, is to be a laborer um, in this effort to always honor and respect my ancestors uh, in this, who are in this country as far back as I can trace, enslaved in this country, enslaved in the South. So I'm, I'm always gonna talk about them. Yeah. One thing that my family, they were very patriotic. Can't go a generation without identifying somebody in the military. In fact, we weren't encouraged to go to college. After high school, go to General Motors or go to the military. That was my dad's option. We went to college, as you know. Those were, that, but that, those were the two options for us. 
and so for so many generations. So we, we believed in the hope, and we believe in the hope of what it might mean for us to be here. We continue to fight to this day for what it means to be liberated, what it means to be free, what it means to live out those words that are inscribed um, and written by certain people, certain white men that own slaves. We are here to, as a reminder of all the things that folks hope for in American democracy. And so that's why I collect the types of items that I collect. That's why I tell the types of stories that I tell. That's why I spend time with my family and I'm grateful for my family that they open these stories for us. They created an environment where we could have magazines, we could have black art, we could have black conversations. We had, com but, you know, my grandmother, this will be my last story and I'm a, I want to bring some people up, but um, one thing that was so great about my grandmother in Baylor Court, um, not only did we have the quilts that if you were a stranger and you needed some, a place to go or if you were in, you know, Northern Aurora Drum and Bugle Corps or the Saganeers Drum and Bugle Corps and mom and dad and part of the Boosters Club, you're going to see a very diverse group of kids and young folks on the floor. Same thing as um, participating in sports at Carlton, my older sister, older brother, um, or as I was winning ancient history and academic track. <laughs> I'm so glad I had my family here. Y'all supposed to clap. I, have, I, still, I, I might still have a, thank you, I might still have a record. I'm lying, I don't have it. But we had a very um, diverse upbringing, that, but we also had very many opportunities to talk about what it meant for us um, to be black, um, to love being black, to have black items, uh, but also what it meant for us to be a part of larger communities. So uh, when I think of this show that's behind you, the black hand side, it's really my whole childhood experience. It's really my family's experience. It's a place where you can learn about history and our role in that history, but it's also a place where you can experience the black joy. You can experience black creation, black creatives, so when I came up, when I was thinking about this term of black tea king, and then, you know, now with the show, The Black Hand Side, it's beyond what I could have even imagined. And your support, each of you, I want to thank you for, you know, the different ways in which you actively poured into this vision for the 51 people that donated money so that we could make an offering to the Saginaw Art Museum to help extend hours. I want to thank you. It was because people believed in what's happening. People believe in the work. Yeah. Um, people believe in community. People believe in Saginaw. Yeah. And so we are here, you know, as a part of the work that's being done. We are here to, you know, celebrate all that's been accomplished and even acknowledging there's more that we want to do. So with that, I actually want to bring up uh, the other artists I should, not artists. I want to bring up the artists, uh, creators, and collectors of the Black Hand Side, and those who are in the room. So, if you all could come up, please, please. Naisha, Lark, Devon, So, um, you know, there are a few people that are not here. So I'm, I'm excited that Naisha, Devon, Lark um, are here. I also want to thank um, Corin Grooms, um, Trell Frazier, uh, Patrick Haley, um, and Taya's Haley, yep, and Taya's Haley Taya, Young. Taya Young. I want to thank the Hamiltons for donating art uh, and pieces to the show. Anytime I do a show, you know, I like to make sure that it's, it's really community, a community feel. Um, I use a tagline, I'm a curator of artifacts and art, people and experiences, and that's what we try to bring people together. Um, but with that, I want to stop talking because I've been talking too much um, and turn it over to uh, Naisha, Devon, and Lark who will say a few comments. And I'm gonna actually say. <laughs> So um, the 
name of the show is The Black Hand Side. Growing up, you were here. Give me five yeah. on The Black Hand Side. <laughs> and it was more than just a, a rhyme. It had a deeper meaning. It says, I see you. I recognize you. I really see you. And, and I like you on the black hand side. So that sense of belonging, that sense of togetherness, that is, that's the experience that we wanted to share. That's the nostalgia that we, that we are trying to bring. We have, with the fusion of uh, Kevin's collection of antiques and um, some Afrofuturism and painting and uh, sculptures, we came together and we did something beautiful yeah. and it's so wonderful. Thank you for just the support, just the community support. Because one thing that's so important is that this is not black history. This is American history. Yes, and, and without this, there wouldn't be, there would be no that. So you can't, you can't separate uh, water from wet. Right. So we have to, we, we, have, we have the balance and, and we have the support of the community and that, that, that means so much. So yes, thank you. How y'all doing? I'm Devon Collins and first I'd like to give a, like can y'all clap for Kevin, like give Kevin a big <laughs> And to the Saginaw Art Museum. Yeah. Being from Saginaw, I would ride past this place quite often yeah. and would not think that I would have something that was worthy to be in the Saginaw Art Museum. <laughs> so again, like, I told Kevin, like, I don't think I would be in this place if it wasn't for him and his vision of the place and what he wanted to do. So that's why I wanted to get Kevin, like, a big, big shout out. Right. I'm not a big talker, but I just want to say thank you all and a big shout out to Saginaw for supporting this and understanding what it takes for us, like he said earlier, we building a family of artists to represent Saginaw and hope y'all like it and yeah. hope y'all understand like this is something we love to do and the pieces in the place, they hot. <laughs> they hot. So I'm gonna give it to Lark now. <laughs> Well, I just want to start by just thanking everybody for coming. Um, these events have been kind of overwhelming for me because of the turnout. And I, I got to give a special thanks to Kevin because he brought everything together. And yeah. I've been here for almost 10 years. And it, I haven't had a network of artists, you know, uh, colleagues, you know. And I, I honestly began to think that, you know, where's the talent in Saginaw? You know, where are the people that I can collaborate with? Uh, Kevin made that possible in one show. Yeah. And so I just want to thank you for that, Kevin. You know, it means a lot. I mean, you put together an exhibition that got the most talented local black artists in the community together. Yeah. And we're going to stay together. We're like brothers and sisters now. So I want to thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. And I can't say enough about how the show came together. It's amazing for you to come up with the concept of the past, present, and the future. 
in one exhibit and do it and combine that with local artists to showcase their talents. I mean, it's just a remarkable idea. And, and I hope more of the community comes out to see this. Um, so I just want to say thank you again for coming. And um, we hope to do more things like this in the future. Thank you. So we will take a, a few questions to answer, then we'll be around. But also, before we take questions to answer, understand that Lark got a whole exhibit yes. down here that's incredible. So there's, there's three um, exhibits. We're honored to um, have the work of the, our local chapter of the NAACP telling a graphical um, advocacy story. So please check that out on this back wall. You see in the black hand side. But Lark's work, yeah. Lark invited Naisha out to his house and I, I ain't never want to steal from nobody's house before. <laughs> but I told him like, you better like your doors. <laughs> like his work is incredible. So please go down the hall. I encourage you also to go upstairs to the second floor in the museum. There's either um, um, photos in the basement. Check out this entire space. I want to make sure that everybody's spirit, footprint, carbon footprint, whatever, is traced on these floors. So please go through here, because we're going to create a new flow in this space. So that means you got to go through every part of this museum. They close at 5. They trying to go home at 5. Um, <laughs> One more thing. Um, I hate to put you on the spot, but Thor, did you make these? So Thor made these for uh, my exhibit, Africa to Eternity. And they're like, um, it's actually really a fun thing to do if you want to pick up one at the desk. And it's kind of like a treasure hunt. You can, you can walk around the exhibit and, and try to find things that are in the picture and try to figure out um, how did I make them and what did I use. So, yeah. Questions. Yes. I'm originally from Georgia. Uh, I came here from Atlanta, Georgia, and um, I actually um, I met my wife here. She's in the uh, audience back there. Wait. And so I, I actually. Um, Went to graduate school here and permanently located at the graduate school in Saginaw. So, yes. Love her. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Are there any more questions before I pass the. I don't have yes. questions, but I just want to say thank you for this. This has been amazing. Um, most people in Saginaw always say there's nothing to do in Saginaw. Um, I didn't know how this was advertised. You can play it. Take at least one or two more questions. Yes. How would someone make an antique at home? How would someone make an antique at home? So easy. It's easy to make an antique at home. So let me tell you about this. In order to have an antique, you got to start creating now. And this is why we all should be creators. And not just creators, we should also preserve our stuff. So, in these contemporary times, as we have items, or as we find items, hold on to them. And then they, they value. Now, things will have value based on how people view it. Things that I might pay $100 for, Maisha look at them and be like, I'll give you a bag of Skittles. <laughs> so sometimes the value is inherent to us or to our communities. And so never, so for me, it's not necessarily about the money, it's about 
the attachment it has in my heart, the attachment it has to the community. And so start making your items now because they will, they can become antiques by collecting them or vintage items. Hope that answers your question. We can talk more. Yes, sir. One, I'm afraid to answer this question because this is a legend. <laughs> like, I'm tr like, this is a legend. Yeah. Julie's a legend. Like, if you can't go down Davenport Bay Road and see, and not see a billboard with his face on it. Advertising Swag Magazine. So if you have not gotten your subscription to Swag Magazine. So let me ask you, how do we do this? <laughs> I really don't know. I'm actually like, I'm, I'm really, no, but I, I think I, I, I appreciate having loving parents. I think it's always important that we respect our parents. Yeah. Um, my mom knows, you know, it wasn't always easy. <laughs> we, made it. we made it. We made it. But having respect for your parents, your community, I think, and having respect for yourself, I think those are some of the most important things. And when you're in a community that's encouraging you to do it, we have to do it. And so that's imperative for all of us as, you know, who might consider ourselves as, as adults, make sure that we have a young person who can come to us and have conversations with us and that can get advice. You know, we have to be approachable. We have to be teachable, even in our, you know, I'm 45. <laughs> I just got an iPhone. I was a joy user, but, you know. So, we, so as adults, we have to be teachable so the young people can, can flourish. Like, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm so honored to have you here. Um, you know, since moving back to Saginaw, I've been able to just follow your story, your family story, and just, just really impressed and amazed. And so I think you keep doing the good work that you're doing, and I, I'm seeing young people that are replicating um, what you're doing and doing other great things. So thank you. Get your, back, your subscription to Swag Magazine. <laughs> looking for a building, like we are looking for a building, so that what you ask for, that can be taught black history, not just through the month of February, but all throughout the year. We looking for a building to accommodate your request and your, so we will be doing something to further and for you. And with you being here, like he said, <laughs> with Swag Magazine and being able to share these locations or this location, that would be a great help uh, for the whole community. Yeah. yeah. And for now, uh, I would suggest, and I suggest you always do this, don't be afraid to talk to people. Ask, them, ask about them. Where are you from? You'll be surprised how many people will share a lot of history with you just, yeah. just based on that. And get you some older friends. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the concepts that... Uh, We spent a lot of time talking um, and thinking, just thinking of ideas, conjuring up some, some things. And so we have some ideas for, you know, making more interactive live art, um, having opportunities for, you know, an, you know, for ancestors to and, and our elder people, our elderly and the visitor community to speak and share their knowledge. Um, you know, different places around the world um, are doing um, uh, living libraries where to check in with someone and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, particularly in a museum type type setting. Um, so you know, we'll be, we're working on that in one of our next iterations. But you know, um, how we got here is because we had to put out a lot of pleas, and we were actually excited to expand the art museum uh, to plead to our request to find space in the community to host it. Uh, 
will, until we have our own, we'll continue to look and look for partnerships to produce these with other types of shows. Yeah. Sorry. So if you have a business, you know, please say your business name. Okay, cool. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Yeah. <laughs> Guess I'm with my fam now. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? I'm Nicholas Hurd, also known as Quasi. I'm a yoga and meditation instructor here in Saginaw. Uh, it's been something I've been very passionate about for almost a decade now, and it's uh, exciting to be uh, in the city that I'm from and share that with everybody here. Um, it's been a blessing to be uh, to see Black Ticket grow, you know, from where it was on Hamilton and just, you know, parking in that spot, not knowing what was in the door. And, and you and Aisha just coming in and just letting me, like, check out the space. And, and Hayes also, you know, a creator in Saginaw and just so much going on in Saginaw um, that you're really, if you, were, if you didn't do it, you know, I don't know if it would have got done. So, you know, big ups to you for, for sharing the space, for passing the ball, how you passed the ball. And um, I'm excited for this exhibit and I'm excited to see um, how you know, your age and how you uh, interacted with blackness, how it grows, and then how the, uh, the, the generations now are interacting with blackness and how it grows. Yeah. And just, just keep seeing that infusion and that support uh, amongst everybody in the space. Yeah. For sure. Thank you. Ashe. Thank you. 